the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. Welcome to Squawk Box. We are live from London and Sylvia is in Copenhagen. Here are your headlines. Wall Street snaps a volatile three-day losing streak and the rebound rolls on in Asia as the BOJ's deputy governor plays down the chances of another hike in the near term. Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris picks Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as her running mate in a bid to secure key votes in Rust Belt states. I learned the art of compromise without compromising my values. Now, Vice President Harris and I are running to take those very values to the White House. Chinese exports unexpectedly fall to a three-month low, but imports surprised to the upside, growing at their fastest pace since April. All eyes on Novo Nordisk as the largest company in Europe is set to report results, with analysts expecting a potential increase in guidance. We'll be speaking with the CEO later today on a first on CNBC interview. Perhaps if you ever wanted to see if there was just an overstatement, perhaps an overreaction to some potential news in the market, well, clearly the market then picks up again quite convincingly and gives you that sort of thought. The key question mark, though, is was that really the end then of that correction base? Was the fears around the recession that has been alleviated somewhat? Is the market still anticipating 50 basis points of hikes in September alone and 105 basis points worth of hikes then this year? of cuts, should I say. Well, that seems to be the basis uh, thus far for the market still in play. But despite all of that, we saw the market begin to pick up. 1% across both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. The end of what was a three-day down streak then uh, for the market across Wall Street, even a 300-point, near 300-point uptick then for the Dow Jones Industrial following what we have seen, that 1,000-point uh, decline we saw, of course, on Monday. And after hours trading, also very significant to look at the moves there. But all 11 sectors of the S&P 500 were actually on the up then uh, in yesterday's turnaround. So will that turnaround continue as well into today's picture? But these are the key factors that move things higher. It was the tech stocks again. Those will ultimately be big news factors, right? Because these have such a great pull, uh, particularly on that S&P 500 move then. So you saw Meta manage to move up uh, nearly 4%. They're eight-tenths of a percent higher for uh, Tesla with Microsoft and Netflix also 1% uh, to the good there. Netflix, a key question mark around those price hikes as well. Will they be instantaneous? instituting some of those and how's that going to impact the business a big three percent uptick as well for nvidia awaiting those earnings still to come in a few weeks time then apple and alphabet though the ones who declined in that trade on the treasuries front though well this has been very interesting they inched up then because those recession fears are still in play key question marks then that the market is wondering whether you will get a recession coming into the fall so you had seen this uh, drop off quite considerably but still below uh, three, uh, rather four percent. Yesterday it was hovering below the 3.9 percent mark. In fact, then and has now tilted just above that. So more than two basis points gained uh, in this morning trade. Back above four percent though for the two year. So that's 4.02. And as you can tell, that spread then uh, just between the two, hovering at around 11 basis points then uh, in this early Asian trading picture. On to the dollar crosses then uh, as well. The dollar firmer surging as much as two percent against the yen. Now, this is very interesting. The Bank of Japan's deputy governor has said that the central bank will not raise interest rates when financial markets are unstable. I mean, when are they ever fully, fully stable, right? For now, you're seeing 147.56 being the mark then uh, for that dollar yen. You're seeing some strength then for the dollar. Weakness again then for the yen. How much further will you see that weakness sort of uh, continue there? 1.5% uh, down was the last mark early this morning. That's come off now. As you can see, more than 2% weaker. Still a bit of stability then for some of the other uh, crosses as well. 
On the Asian market front then, well, Asian markets extended gains then today following on from what we saw uh, out of Wall Street then, a near 4% uptick then for the topics, of course, which had taken a big decline then. Also, recovering from what was a big decline then on Monday as well. 2.8% uh, stronger as well for the Japanese market overall. The Hang Seng, 1.5% uh, stronger there. Samsung Electronics spiking over 4%, in fact, then reporting that an, its 8-layer HBM3E chips had then been cleared for tests by NVIDIA in their uh, AI processes. So that will be interesting to look at. And of course, we do have data as well coming out of China. Those export numbers there growing faster than expected in the month of July, Karen. So let's put some flesh on the bones around markets because there's no doubt the action has been violent, a lot of ruffled feathers out there in the markets. And if you look at what we've seen on the Japanese market, which don't forget was the epicenter of a lot of the concerns around the carry trade unwinding, we've seen a pretty convincing snapback on the Japanese stock market. But beyond that, the bounce back we saw yesterday, turn around Tuesday, as the phrase was coined by one of our market participants, it wasn't that convincing. Yeah beyond Japanese stocks. So even on Wall Street, you know, the size of the gain is pretty small to the upside given the extent of the sell of day earlier. And in Europe too, also fairly tame in terms of the gains that we saw on the boards yesterday. So what are we dealing with? These twin themes, the reasons for the market sell-off. And I think this idea that we're heading towards a US recession still took a lot of us by surprise, given we really were not on that page. We were all convinced by central banks, by some of the data that we're heading towards some sort of a soft landing. So getting into that, we've had more data on the back of uh, the US economy, the US services sector showing that rebound from a uh, four year low. Even one of the elements that was brought up by those thinking we're heading towards some sort of a recession, this was the uh, so-called Claudia Sam rule. And she's also weighed in and said, look, this time could actually be different. Last time round, uh, don't forget, you've seen various different changes this time with people coming out of the labor market. Now you've had people coming back in in a big way, but 420 odd thousand workers entering the labor force last month. So this time, if you're looking at the change in the unemployment rate and the, the same road goes that if you get a swing of more than half of a percent off uh, last year's low, then you might be looking at a recession. And of course, we've had that swing from 3.6 percent in the unemployment rate, uh, which was uh, the US uh, unemployment average a year ago now to 4.3 percent in the latest figure that suggests something is happening but it might be some uh, unusual effects going on in the labor market perhaps as it's not an indicator this time round. So while the Fed definitely doesn't want things to to go horribly wrong of course but is this the point in the market where they say well this is precisely what we're waiting for just this weakness that we know that things are definitely, the inflation process has definitely been staved off. We've completely uh, wiped off, in some ways, the inflation problem. Yes, not back at 2%, but you can tell that that weakness is happening in the market, and this just primes us to then cut. 105 basis points of cuts still anticipated then for this year. Is the market just pretty much doing what it did at the end of 2023? And assuming you're going to get an exorbitant set of cuts now just because you've gotten one piece of bad data, just stateside. I mean, let's remember that, yes, you do have uh, a bit of, uh, of a worry then as well whether you know, traders will also be, be, be going in the other direction. I mean, Citigroup are saying then that the breadth of the selling suggests that professional investors have received a tap on the shoulder from above, ordering them to reduce their risk no matter what they need to offload and do so. So could this just mean that there's more to go still? Well, there's a the concentration decline. of risk in technology names yeah. in particular. So my question is whether we're now seeing a rotation to, and don't forget, real estate was picked up yesterday, and this was an interest rate sensitive part of the markets. Yeah. The other big factor here, and we'll talk about this more during the show, the carry trade. Are we really done in terms of that unwind? Uh, Japanese authorities no doubt helping as they talk about slower rate hikes and uh, hikes, of course. Uh, in this point, when you've got market volatility, it's just not going to happen at this stage. Well, later on today, uh, we will get the uh, pulse check on the global economy economy and come down to the U.S. election with Jamie Dimon as the J.P. Morgan Chase CEO embarks on his annual bus tour through America's Midwest. That exclusive interview is coming up at uh, 1900 CET on the exchange. To the politics and Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris has tapped Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as her running mate in her bid to become America's first female president. Harris and Walz made their first appearance as a joint ticket at a rally in Philadelphia. Since the day that I announced my candidacy, I set out to find a partner 
who can help build this brighter future. A leader who will help unite our nation and move us forward. A fighter for the middle class. A patriot who believes, as I do, in the extraordinary promise of America. A promise of freedom, opportunity, and justice, not just for some, but for all. I'm here today because I found such a leader. Walls was thrust into the political spotlight in July after he said Republicans like Trump, who has suggested Harris turned black for political gain, are weird. Walls doubled down on that criticism at the rally. His running mate shares his dangerous and backward agenda for this country. J.D. Vance literally literally wrote the foreword for the architect of the Project 2025 agenda. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! That's not what middle America is. And I got to tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. A uh, play there from the Midwest uh, from Walsh. Well, Trump's campaign hit out at the pick with a close source telling NBC News the Democratic nominee has caved to the Hamas caucus. Trump took to his true social platform to speculate on the chances Biden could crash the Democratic National Convention and try to take back the nomination. Well, Amanda Rentera joins us now, Democratic strategist and former national political director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. This is uh, an interesting turn of events for the Democrats. Walsh, uh, if you look at uh, his background, he is plain speaking, authentic Mr. Normal. He's got runs on the board in terms of uh, making gains against Republicans. What does this uh, pick as VP mean for the Democrats and their chances in your view? Well, I think what you're seeing is really the vision that the Democratic Party has for the country, widening the tent, making sure that people know everyone is welcome and that the clear message is what is our future and our future looks bright. It looks joyful. It looks together. And that's really the message of today. You could feel the energy um, and no doubt everyone who doesn't know the vice president uh, candidate right now will get a chance to know a regular guy high school coach, teacher, and someone who's also served in the military for 24 years. So I think this is going to be an interesting race for the next 100 days or less than 100 days now. Um, and folks are really going to see a dis different campaign in Trump and J.D. Vance and Kamala and Tim Waltz. I want to pick up on the Rust Belt because in that clip that we played, you could see very much that this pick for VP was going after that middle America. And we know J.D. Vance has some significant advantages in that area, too. He's been going after the so-called Rust Belt, uh, given popularity around his book. But if we look at Walsh, uh, he has this ability to appeal to uh, the middle America working class, but also to progressives. Just talk to us how he can execute on some of those so-called swing states in the Rust Belt. Well, first of all, he's just a pragmatic person. You like him. You want to work with him. I actually worked with him on the farm bill, worked with him um, during the national campaign in 2016. He is a likable guy trying to really build relationships and do something together. A lot of the work that he has done as gov in his governor role had to work with both sides of the aisle to move things forward in a pretty challenging time for the state of Minnesota. And I think what people will see is really his ability to can make connection with anyone out there and then drive those relationships to make the world better for all. And I think you're gonna see the authenticity come through. And that's incredibly important right now as you see politics is very divisive, a lot of negative energy. And to see this joyous energy enter the race, I think is gonna really make a big difference as you get into the last days of this election. Amanda, allow me to put maybe a little bit of a, of a down on things and ask the question as to why not Pennsylvania, for example, uh, as one of the swing states, right? Uh, if you consider Josh Shapiro being one of those, Joe Biden only won Pennsylvania um, by just, what is it, one point? 
especially when considering the money that the Trump campaign has spent in that state. And of course, that assassination attempt could perhaps rile up a few uh, um, supporters as well. Is that not perhaps a state you could have won? Or does the does the optics of that not really matter? You just needed somebody that will galvanize nationally as opposed to just statewide. Well, Kamala had a lot of great choices. And when she made her calculation, you know, their candidates make it on part of politics, but also really what kind of chemistry do you have? And that really matters when you're on the stage together, but also when you're governing. And so she didn't have a bad choice here. I think people will look at that and wonder what would happen if she had a Governor Shapiro. Um, but frankly, I think this ticket is full of joy, looks very different. I mean, who who he is from a rural America, rural roots, Midwestern style really does broaden the ticket with Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. And I think it would have just been a different strategy um, with Governor Shapiro. And at the end of the day, it really is who is going to be your partner in an incredibly intense election and to really govern the country. I mean, this is also where his resume will be scrutinized uh, the absolute most. What could derail then for his push to the White House alongside Kamala Harris? I think it's going to be tough to derail him. I mean, you have someone who has been in elected office for a very long time, who has had to deal with challenges coming at him in an executive role. Um, and so I don't see or foresee what's ahead, although I have to say anytime you're in an election against Trump, it's always an unusual path. But I think you have a veteran here that really can help, really build stability on the campaign, but really how to, in, how to really inject a joy even when you're getting attacked, which is going to be an important piece of uh, this election cycle in order to bring people along and win in November. Yeah, look, this race is uh, 90 days away still. There's, there's so much still at play, so much that could uh, definitely happen. Now both sides have to find a way to be perfect up until that point. Amanda, thank you so much for the time this morning. Really appreciate it. Amanda Renteria is Democratic strategist and former national political director for, the, uh, for Hillary's 2016 presidential campaign. Now coming up on the show, Europe's largest company by market cap, Novo Nordisk, reports its second quarter earnings this hour will cross live to Sylvia, who's in Copenhagen. Plus, two of Japan's biggest corporates, SoftBank and Sony, they also report this morning. We'll discuss the results and look at how they've been navigating the recent instability in the Japanese market. And ABN AMRO posts a second quarter net income beat. We'll be hearing from the Dutch lender's CFO, that's happening next. Ambition to me is about doing better. I think ambition creates a pathway. The best advice I can give someone starting off a career is don't have a career, have lots of careers, try loads of different things. Talk to people and put your ambition out there. I don't feel that I've hit peak ambition because it's a learning journey. CNBC is where ambition meets opportunity. What does living ambitiously mean to you? Hear it from our CNBC anchors, reporters and global business leaders on CNBC.com. Now, ABN AMRO has posted a second quarter net profit beat coming in at 642 million euros. The Dutch lender is raising its guidance for the year, saying it expects net interest income to top 6.4 billion euros. The CFO of ABN AMRO is uh, Ferdinand van Draga and joins us now. Uh, Ferdinand, thank you so much for the time. This is a, uh, I mean, when one considers the harshest effects of a cycle in which we saw interest rates rise up as they have, the last thing you'd anticipate to see is still the ability to, to notch up your guidance and even have your return on equity at levels where you had said, well, this is a 2026 target. H how have you been able to do so? Yes, yeah, thanks uh, and good morning. Uh, as you said already, and it's also a uh, reiteration of uh, uh, Q1 when I was on your show, it's a very good profitability, mainly driven by solid uh, net interest income. And you mentioned already number one is a more positive interest rate backdrop. But number two, it's also a very good commercial business momentum 
For example, if you look at new mortgage production, it's almost up 50% comp compared to last year, and we solidified our leading market position. And it's also good cost control, and again a quarter with uh, impairment releases. So if you add all the three together, you come to an ROE above our 26, uh, 26 targets. Uh, the second part of your question already there, uh, it's clear that we do expect uh, uh, for uh, the coming period and next year a gradual normalization of, uh, of impairments as well as over the longer term a gradual normalization of, uh, of net interest margins. Yeah, I mean in a time for Fernando then when you look at a cost to income of 60% that, that still remains your target yeah. here. I mean, trying to achieve that in this in this market and doing so restrictively, doing so with a good business momentum and rem keeping costs under control, the difficulty of doing that obviously must come with having to, to, to sacrifice other parts of the business. I is that even happening or is it just a case of, well, find the bolt-on acquisitions that work and ultimately get the results? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that is number one. Cost control is very important. We have more visibility for this year as we concluded our CLA negotiation for two years uh, in, uh, in July. So we reiterate our absolute cost guidance for this year of 5.3 billion. But as you said, if you look at our longer term cost income target, that also comes together with a focused growth. Uh, we significantly de-risked the bank and we wound down our non-core operations, but we're also looking at bolt-on acquisition opportunities. And uh, we announced the acquisition of Bux, the Neo broker in Q1. And in Q2, we announced the acquisition of Hauk Aufhauser Lampe in Germany, almost doubling our assets on the management of, uh, of the private bank. So it's, uh, it's both sides. It's number one is good cost control, but also definitely looking at organic and inorganic and growth opportunities. Ferdinand, it's Karen jumping in. We've had an incredible few days Hi, on markets though, and as we talk about your guidance being bumped up for the year, how confident are you in that guidance, particularly if we do see some extraordinary moves by central banks, that the market is now still working its way around, whether it could even be another 50 basis point move lower from the ECB in September? Uh, yes, Karen, I think number one, we're clearly monitoring uh, the market, uh, market volatility. And yes, uh, uh, we do think uh, the risk of a recession in, in, in the US increased, but overall we do expect interest rate cuts uh, uh, also in the US and the US economy to keep growing below trend. If you look in Europe, uh, uh, our forecasts are based on our own economic forecasts, and there we already had in our base case a uh, year-end uh, ECB rates of uh, 3% and 1.5% end of uh, 2025. So the rate cuts are already in our base, uh, base forecast. And if you look at the overall volatility, uh, we significantly uh, uh, restructured, uh, restructured the bank. 60% of our total uh, balance sheet is in mortgages. And if you look uh, specifically at mortgages, House prices are at record levels, and as I said before, if you look at house price transactions in the Netherlands, it's up uh, uh, 25% and for us 50% compared to, compared to last year. So in the core of our business, you see healthy growth, but we are clearly monitoring uh, the situations in, uh, in, uh, in the global markets carefully. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market moving news, you can head to cnbc.com. Or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho and myself, Arabi Lekumete, weekdays on CNBC.